today we're honored to have Jonas Dodu and um, Jonas besides being the boss at Speedworks um, I'm not really sure what is your official title with England athletics which to us is England track and field I have no title I don't work for them so I, no. I work I work for British athletics and the way we differ over here is um, Brit British athletics focuses on elite performance, putting people on teams to go to World Olympics, etc., or junior champs. And England athletics is more about the development of the coaches and the athletes from a grassroots level. Um, so I worked for British athletics from, um, I don't know, 2009 till the 2012 Olympics. And since that point, I've been self-employed. Um, my wife and I worked together as apprentices under Dan Path. Um, my wife continued to work for British Athletics until maybe um, 2015. And then she worked for England Athletics as a, uh, a lead for multi-events coach education up until maybe, I don't know, 2018. Um, and then since then, I've stolen her back and she now is purely Speedworks. So I, I don't have a role within uh, any of the national bodies in the country, um, but I, I do end up servicing, supporting uh, mentoring a, a number of coaches who are either working for England Athletics or are part of the system. Now, so, is your wife Julie, she, she was an Olympian, right? Yeah, Julie was an Olympian. She's Julie Dodu now, but she was Julie Holman, um, even though I'm sure her Facebook still says Holman and we argue about that once a week. Um, and uh, she was a heptathlete, competed at Beijing Olympics, but maybe shouldn't have gone. She, she was meant to go to Athens, but got injured. And, and like most athletes held on for another three or four years, uh, went to Beijing, um, but actually probably should have quit a, a year or two before that. So just to give everyone an idea, what are facilities like, regard, whether you're, it's for Speedworks or with British athletics or English athletics? Because I think here in the States, we take for granted the fact that we have easy access to tracks. Like within my house in a five mile radius, I can get to four, eight lane, 400 meter tracks that are very well taken care of. Yeah, I mean, outdoor tracks in the country, yeah, you, you, probably not as, as, um, as many as you guys, obviously, but there are, there are enough outdoor tracks in the country. Some are maintained very well, some are maintained badly, but generally there are enough decent outdoor tracks. The problem we have is it's always cold. And so indoor tracks is where really, um, you can get a lot of work done. And across the country is probably between six and eight indoor tracks. Um, I'm based at one in Loughborough. Prior, I was in London at Lee Valley. It's another Wait, one. So say that again so everyone knows. In the whole country, in the whole country, there's the whole country, six to eight indoor six tracks. Six to eight indoor tracks. So you, what you find is that the majority of elite sprints and jumps groups orientate themselves around the most local indoor track. And once you have an indoor track, it looks like any other indoor track. And But for us, it feels like a haven. There's a big difference between the work you can do, in, uh, you would know, between what you can do indoors versus outdoors, especially as it's cold <laughs> near enough year round bar two or three months here. Um, it's not cold like Canada or Nebraska, but it's, it's cold enough to put off um, even the most enthusiastic sprinter. So um, by all means, you've got, you've got to find a way. Now, beyond those indoor tracks, there are sports halls, there are different things, hallways, different ways people evolve their method to be able to stay in, uh, away from the elements. But um, yeah, having a good indoor track with a good mat and, and good space is, is uh, priceless for us. And how easy is it to get access to something like that? Like, do you have to reserve that? Do you have to pay for that? Is that a now, now due thing? to COVID, now due to COVID, it's very difficult because depending on what our government decide to do on any day, which changes every day and every week. So that's part of the problem. But depending on what they want to do, essentially, you have to be quote unquote elite to access the indoor tracks. Um, and so everyone else is being forced to be outdoors or not to use the tracks at all. So the athletes that I coach, um, well, some of the athletes I coach fall into the status of elite, so I can train them inside. But I have some international athletes that are also elite, but because of international, I don't know, politics, 
they do, do not count as being elite in this country to our government. So we, we cannot train them. So but one of my really good French guys, he's gone back home and I'm training him um, online at the moment. He's taken a GPS unit. He's taken basically lots of my kit and he'll figure out how to get it all done. And we're just training online. So it's not as easy as you would like it to be. COVID has definitely put a, a spanner in, in normal training routine. And how do athletes funnel their way to you? Like here, I think everyone knows, most of the people listening are American. We know that you have high schools and you go to college and there's state meets and things like that. But how do they, because I know the high schools or you know your secondary schools don't have athletic teams. Colleges don't have that kind of athletic support where you, know, you have multi-million dollar complexes for each sport. So how does that work its way through your system in England? And I think this is interesting because like you go to different countries, if like you go it's to New Zealand, there's right. 5 million people there. You know, that's like being a state champion here in Illinois where we have, you know, there's 12 million people that live here. Mm. Uh, so I think it's interesting. So people see how it works in other places and how it's really fixed in the States here for people to work their way up to whatever level they can get to. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we always admire the state system for a variety of reasons. And, and, and I think it's, it's quite nice for athlete migration reasons. And we can talk more about that if you like. But I think it's nice to know that you can go to a school uh, as a junior school and you can progress to another level. You may not stay with the same coach, but you move on to a high school, maybe then you move on to college. And then if you're really lucky, you can move on to a pro system. Um, and that even if you are not the top 20 sprinter in the country, you could potentially still find a college that will still give you a scholarship and you can still continue to work really hard um, as a track and field athlete alongside your studies. Whereas here, um, you could start at a club at any age and stay with that coach all the way until you become an Olympic athlete. There is no real athlete migration expected. In fact, it's the opposite. There is a lot of, that's my athlete. There's a lot of um, ownership from coaches over athletes, which isn't very healthy at all. Um, and then when it comes to our system specifically, I, I'm not from track and field. I come from rugby. I did my degree and decided after meeting Dan Path and, and studying Dan that I wanted to do track. So I haven't come through the club system. I threw javelin when I was younger and I was pretty good at it, but I, I played rugby instead. And so I never really went from my club, my local club. So when I came back into athletics, I started coaching athletes and I went to my local club and I said, okay, I've got some of these other kids. And they said, what club now? So I'm like, they're from the club down the road. They said, you can't train them here. I said, but they don't actually go to that club anymore. They don't have any coaches that want to coach them there. You've got zero kids here. Look, you know, let me create a bit of an environment. It's like, no, that's not what we do. If you want to join our club, you have to coach only our athletes. And like, okay, I get it. You wouldn't go to Arsenal and decide to coach some kids from Chelsea, but it's an amateur sport and they were really struggling for participation. So I stopped coaching for that club, continued to use the facilities as a, as just as a public user, like a community user. And I started coaching kids from any club at any level who just wanted to train because I just wanted to coach. Um, and so from that moment, I was a bit of a pariah for a while and I started doing things differently. I started um, bringing medical to the track, a, a, a bed. I, I did a bit of sports therapy before I really focused on coaching. I started having to fix athletes because, again, I hadn't coached anyone to any level. So the only athletes that came to me were either not really talented or were broken. And so it's like, OK, well, I had re lots of recl reclamation projects to do and from that moment, I started doing things a bit differently to how it was done. So at first, I started um, creating a bit of a network, coaching athletes from different sports, different events, being almost a part-time consultant to some athletes. They had their coach and their setup, but they had issues. They were injured repetitively or they were stagnant and they came to me for advice. And that, again, was very different. You either stayed with your coach and you treated him like a god or you left him. It was never that you stayed with your coach and then you had outside advice. Um, and I started charging a bit of a coaching fee. I started a charity and that charity allowed me to find some funding and find some support that subsidized the coaching 
for the athletes and they would pay a bit of a fee that allowed us to train near enough like a full-time group and I had people send letters to the to our governing body to say that's not allowed this guy is not from our sport he's doing things differently he's poaching our athletes and I'm like poaching how do you steal an athlete you don't all it is like if, if you have been divorced five times and your wife always leaves you for the same kind of person, is it your wife's fault, that person's fault, or do you need to look at yourself and say, I need to brush my teeth a bit more. I need to buy some roses for my wife or I need to fart in private because I keep pushing them all away, right? You, you, but in, in track and field, especially in this country, we seem to point the finger everywhere else. Our athletes aren't coming through. We've got the best juniors in the world and they're not becoming seniors. It's because of British athletics. It's because of this, it's because of that. It's always pointing this way, but never pointing this way. And so I, I, at the beginning, I, I, I ruffled lots of feathers. And um, three years after I created Speedworks and I was essentially a, a, a private organization almost, three years after that, there's another 12 groups in the country doing exactly the same thing. Four years after that, there's probably another 20 groups in the country doing exactly the same thing. They're, they've, they're providing sports therapy either themselves or outsourcing it. They're, they're running internships. They are doing some coach education in team sports to be able to support themselves, to be able to be full-time coaches, and they're doing things differently. Um, so at first I was a pariah, and now maybe I'm an innovator. I don't know. How did you develop a relationship with the University of Loughborough? Um, I was, uh, so my son is six next week or in two weeks time. And so I guess seven years ago, I was working for Bath Rugby Club, but living in London, was driving back and forth to Bath and was burning myself out, but it was all right until I had a son. And then once I had a son, I was missing bath time. I was missing lots of the good stuff. So I quit doing that and I told my wife, right, I'm only going to find consultancies in London. And literally about a month later, I got a, a, a message from Derby County Football Club, which is an equal distance from Bath. You know, I mean, I was driving two hours to Bath, two and a half hours. Now Derby is just north, but it's the same thing, two and a half hour drive. Um, and this was in, in the build up to 2017 London. Um, my athletes did really well in London. I had two athletes, um, Reese and, and Daryl. Reese made the final in the 100. Daryl didn't make the final, final, but she ran a PB 11.13, something like that, um, as, as still a, as a teenager, or, or maybe she was 20, 21 by that point. And I had to make a decision. British Athletics is based in Loughborough. Derby County is five miles away from Loughborough. It was an easy decision to make, to move up to Loughborough, because I could carry on with Derby. I could, I, I could invite my athletes to move with me. And they, and they moved, they all moved themselves to Loughborough, at least they, those two did. And um, it just enabled me to uh, stay financially viable with my consultancy work, but also have a world-class facility for my athletes to train at. Um, and so, yeah, I found myself in Loughborough. So how do you organize competitions for different age groups? Like for here, you've got high school track and field, and then you have college track and field. But if you've got these clubs... How are they organized? How, how, what does the competition look like? And what does the competition season look like compared to us where we're boxed in by what our school calendar is? Mm, so your school calendar or the competition season in the UK extends like the normal European season, right? Whereas your, your competition season seems to be ending as ours is beginning. And so when we come over to the States to get early comps, um, in April slash May, we would never find the quality of competition here. In fact, we hide from competitions until mid-May slash June because it's just cold. There's just almost no point in competing. Um, but the, 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 there is a very uh, old and um, historical British league uh, amongst the clubs. There used to be a lot, of, a lot more clubs, but the sport is dying. So a lot of clubs have merged together. So Enfield used to be a separate club to Haringey, for example. Now they're Enfield and Haringey. That's just an example. There's lots of examples of this across the country where local rivalries have had to almost squash their rivalries and create a collaboration. Um, but there is, there is a local league. Um, there is a, a youth league, a junior league, a British league, which is a senior league, a women's league um, and a master's league. But the main competition for my athletes 
I'm probably likely, more likely to put them in an open meet in this country or go abroad to a, a higher quality European meet. And so um, there is enough competition here, but we're, we're British. So we don't, we, if the wind is going this way, everyone, doesn't matter where the wind's going, we are running in the straight line, in the line, in the way we've always done it. And you go to you go to Germany or you go to lots of places in Europe. You go to the states and they win legal re meets. They go, okay, we are win positive meets. You say, where's the wind going? It's going this way, right? Switch the track round. We're going. We we want the fastest times possible. No, we're Brits. We want the rules. We don't care about performance. And so there are odd open meets that have um, uh, that that are now around where we're allowed to run with the wind and, and where the, the meet organizers are organized enough to make sure there's paint markings on both sides of the tracks for the hurdles for example um or make sure that there's two sets of of uh of timing equipment on either side of the tracks but they are few and far between um and yeah so i, I i'm co always confused at what routine history um yeah, what uh, tradition does to athlete, for, to sport in general, but specifically to athletics, to, to how we organize things, to how we train things and how we push away things that are different. Feed the cats, feed the cats, sprint year round. We don't want any of that stuff. We are Brits. It's cold outside and we're going to run outside and we're going we're gonna to do interval work and we're just going to do aerobic work because that's how it's always been done. My great grandfather done it that way, so that's how we will do it. And it's just like, uh, how far is your great grandfather? It doesn't matter. Man. What matters is that we do it that way. And it's just like, whoa. And I've been fighting that since since the beginning, and it makes me tired. And my wife laughs at it all the time, and it's just part and parcel of our sport. So it's almost like swallow it or do something different. So now that we got you riled up, what are what are some of the problems in the SNC world? some of the problems in the, um, the, the major problem is a bottom up approach to, to developing KPIs, to deciding on what's important, um, to deciding on benchmarks. It's a bottom up approach. You, you, you say, oh, when I find the fastest athletes in the world, I'm gonna make them squat and look, they can squat this or they can do these weights or they're, you know, these are the end measurements that they can do and so correlation means causation. So it means that in order to get as fast as this individual, we must be able to do the things they can currently do. And it's a, it's a wrong way around. It's absolutely wrong way around. So that's one problem is that is a, is a bottom up approach to setting your KPIs. Um, a, another problem would be that we, we like to do things that we can measure, right? So we, we feel confident when we can measure it. Um, we, can, we feel confident when we can see it. So we, we use binary as an app. People use Dartfish. People just use Coach's Eye, whatever it is. But what you can see is that people that are intimidated by movement, coaching movement strategies, being able to identify biomechanical bits, being able to analyze, and not just that, but synthesize that information and come up with real life solutions for, for the athletes in a way that doesn't overcomplicate it that's actually relatively difficult. It, I've always found it relatively easy for me, but I think it's my skill set. It, it's continuously what I teach at football clubs, rugby clubs, it's, it's how I make my, my living really, is teaching people to see things. Um, or, and you know, keep making things simple is difficult because you've got to know which bit to focus on. And I think the SNC world can see a squat and a clean and, and the bar spinning on the bar or the weight spinning on the bar, and that's quite easy to see. They can see knees over toes or bum back, and that's quite easy to see at one and a half meters per second, but very difficult to see in movement. So that might be part of it. It might be the fact that the SNC world has been given too much power. And what I mean by that is um, the, the, you know, Boo Schick Snyder, you've had him on, and, and the first thing I learned from Boo was that you should probably do your own SNC program as a track coach. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm, you know, I, I'm not an expert teacher of the cleans. I'm not expert teaching these things. No, you're an expert of understanding what your athlete needs and how it's going to transfer to performance. So we come back to this top-down approach. Really, what we should be doing is watching running, watching jumping, 
watching people walk and then set, and then realizing, okay, the, the, the key components for this is projection. Okay, it's around the hip, around control of the lumbar spine. Okay, the key components is about switching their limbs. It's around the, again, around their lumbar spine, but maybe more to do with what the, the interaction between the, the adductors and the hip flexors and the obliques. Okay, and, and the key thing is to be reactive and, and be elastic and stiff on the ground. Okay, that's around their foot, their calf complex. Um, okay, fine. Now let me reverse engineer that. Okay, so how would I develop it? Well, there's different muscles in the hamstrings. There are different ways to develop it. There are different muscles in the trunk, different muscles in the calf. Okay, how can I go away and develop it? What kind of speeds and forces are being developed in those movements? Okay, at different phases of the run, different muscle groups are more dominant, are under more stress. Um, okay, fine. What is, what's the common areas that are hurt? Okay, these, these common areas are hurt at different situations. Right, so now what's my solution? What is my key exercise I want to focus on? Where, what, what type of exercise and when will I do it? That's the right way to do it. I think most of the time it's the other way around. It's, I really like deadlift. I really like cleans. Um, I, I, my balls feel really big when my athletes can lift this weight. Uh, I can pump my chest and we all scream when this happens. Whereas I, I think I speak to 90% of the college, uh, of the coaches that have been really good athletes as juniors and haven't transferred through. And they will say in my four years in college, I, I tripled my squat and I quadrupled my clean and I doubled my bench, but my 40 yard time didn't change or I got slower. And I'll say, so, so all of that energy you put into to changing the weight numbers didn't help you. It was wasted breaths, wasted heartbeats. And so I think the reality is when you have a lot of power as an SNC coach, you, you set, the agenda you say i'm doing a good job if these weights go up if these numbers change whereas if the track coach is the boss and says you only do a good job if my guy runs faster and stays healthy if that doesn't happen you haven't done a good job and and we feel that pressure at the performance level at a real high performance level but nowhere else everywhere else it's the wrong way around Jonas, where do, where do, where can I find that binary software that you use in your presentations? Binary, you can find on our website. Um, you can buy a month, uh, a month subscription or year subscription, and um, it's only been available for Apple up until now. And, and I think the Windows version will be out in the next month or next six weeks. Okay, uh, what does it cost? Uh, binary costs twenty five pounds for a month, for maybe a hundred odd pounds for a year and maybe like 200 pounds for like a lifetime membership so lots of economies of scale as it, as it goes up for sure i think binary for us and i i've always had access to um luckily enough to have because i've had uh, a group of talented athletes that become elite and i went on a journey with six of them for maybe eight years so i've, I've had access to biomechanic support from british athletics speed guns and and opto jump 60 meters, 80 meters worth of opto jump and, um, and just decent analysis. But I, I always got frustrated because they would, we would do a speed testing session and it might take a week or two before I get the data back. And that's useless. Like, you know, sports science should be there to increase the quality of the conversation and decision-making of the coaches and not just to wow the athletes that the kits are out, the lights, the shining bits, it looks fancy and then not influence our coaching. So the great thing about binary or any of those other apps that you can find is just the, the relatively instant feedback that we can create, even if it's not instant, but it's on the day. And then, then you can really like reflection is critical if you wanna accelerate your growth as a coach. And what's great is being able to see things, you've got your own subjective bias, but you see things, you go, okay, that, that run step length was better or, or frequency was better or, you know, there's always, a, there's always a dead spot around step six and seven where he doesn't raise his hips and his ground contact stay the, si stay the same. I can see that with my eyes, but what does the data say? And you look at the data, okay, the data correlates with what I saw. But what I found over the past eight years is that my eye has got sharper the more wrong I've been. When I've believed, oh, I thought I saw this. Frequency is improving in this section. I look at it, frequency, frequency staying exactly the same. And then I ask myself, so why do I think frequency is improving? Oh, okay, ground contact time is reducing. 
and airtime is increasing. So the, the frequency isn't improving. It's just distributed differently in the run. But because ground contact time is getting sharper, it sounds and it feels like frequency is improving. Okay, great. Now I understand a bit of the semantics around what's actually changing in the running. Or step length's improving. Mm, no, actually, step length has decreased, but hip projection distance has improved. Okay, it's good to know the difference. Because actually, if we want to improve our step length, it's, or if we want to improve our projection, more precisely, a lot of athletes will decide, if you say, oh, you need to project yourself further, or you need a bigger step length, they'll end up reaching out further, or pushing for longer on the ground, and having a bigger uh, hip displacement distance on the ground, or toe-off distance. Whereas you might just be asking for them to be more powerful during that same amount of time on the ground. So maybe the shape they make on the floor and the shape they make in their free leg in front doesn't change, but the distance they travel or how quickly they travel during that time does improve. So getting down into the semantics of what I'm seeing, what the athlete's saying and their feeling and what the numbers are actually doing has really helped me to be, I guess, more precise with my language. And I'm, I'm a bit black and white, so is my son. My daughter's not, she's like a mum, but me and my son are very, very black and white. And so you tell me one thing, you tell me it's step length, step improving, and really it's not, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna have a problem with it, but I, I need to be accurate to myself because reflection is critical. And because I'm always trying to translate what the athlete are feeling. And if the athlete feels something, I need to be really clear about what it really means so that I can dial down a bit deeper and to understand them better. So again, binary or any kind of motion analysis has been critical for me to be able to make sense of what I really want, reverse, really truly reverse engineer elite performance. What does it take to run 12 meters per second? And then understand for my junior athlete where they're at now and how I bridge the gap. I went off on a tangent there, I'm sorry. That's okay, it was a good tangent. So can you tell, is there anything that your study, you know, like, like I always ask Chris, you know, who's, you know, he's worked with the 1080 so much. I'm always asking, what have you learned? So mm. what has binary, I'm sure there's been discoveries. You've already mentioned the fact that it's trained your eye, mm -hmm. that it's, that, You've learned from thinking you saw something, but actually it was something else. But mm -hmm. is there some discovery that, that you have made personally that you think is really important? Um, I don't know. I, you know. I don't think there's anything new under the sun. I, I think um, track and field is simple and running fast is easy. Uh, Ground just, contact time is really, really important. Yeah, ground, okay, so if I thought about like important KPIs, ground contact time is really, really important. It's a major critical indicator for me. Um, it's recognizing that once you kind of get to close to 1.3 of your stride length, so whatever your height is, one times by 1.3, of obviously the, um, you can go off of greater, you can go off of leg length, but it's very easy for me to talk about it from in terms of uh, height. Once you kind of get to, relatively close to your optimal or maximal step length, the only way you get any faster is by reducing your ground contact time and keeping your air time relatively level, right? Uh, I think binaries help me to realize that um, if, if I want to run 10 meters per second and, uh, I, I, and yet I have maybe three athletes in front of me that actually some will do it with five hertz, five steps per second with a two meter step length, and some would do it with, I don't know what the rest of the maths would be, would, would do it with a two meter 50 step length and four hertz. That's never going to happen, but it's just part of my example, right? So I think what binaries helped is stress test the ideas that I learned from Dan and that I had learned on my, on my journey anyway, which is there are many roads to Rome. Some are more costly than others. And, and just recognizing that everyone can find a way is just recognizing what they've got in front of you. So I, I think being able to see the maths of how people to put together their top speed has been nice. Drive index has been something we've spoken about quite a lot, which is essentially this, this um, it, it's again, the same thing people are talking about. You need to horizontally orientate your force. 
What does that mean? Come out low, go forwards, don't leak up, don't leak down, don't fall to the side. Um, what does that look like? Well, what we can see is that sometimes we have individuals running similar times to 10 meters, but doing it with a different strategy. So the same person can run to 10 with maybe more airtime in their first three steps, um, with uh, less ground contact time in their first three steps, and they may still get to 10 meters, let's say in 1.8, but their resultant velocity at 10 is different to when they spent less time in the air in the first three steps, more time on the ground, had a lower displacement angle, um, and were able to essentially continue to accelerate across the 10 rather than having a, 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 a big acceleration and then maybe coasting. So I think binary has taught us what Again, the bio, what the biomechs have been saying for a very long time, that smooth data, so smooth increases in step length, smooth increases in velocity, um, relatively smooth or steady maintenance of your frequency after four or five steps, um, smooth reductions in your ground contact time uh, allow you to transition organically, get into your max velocity organically. And I use this word organically, basically meaning that if there are certain things you do in your first three to four steps, good trunk discipline, good shin discipline, and good switching so that you can stay on, on the mark, it allows your hips to raise without having to actively do it. And so that's what I would call an organic transition. And that's simple for the athletes because they just say, go. And as long as they stay on par here, there's one action they have to think about and it allows them to set themselves up to get into max velocity relatively simply. Um, so I think binary has allowed us to stress test our ideas specifically around initial acceleration and how that sets up max velocity um, and specifically around um, comparing apples and oranges, comparing different types of athletes, but who have the same kind of goal, which is keep accelerating, manage the decay of the acceleration and, and essentially hit really high top speeds. Yeah, I kind of see the same thing with the 1080 that if you have a spike, uh, the aftermath of that spike is going to bail you out. So whether you're tracking peak velocity or peak distances, if you don't have a smooth transition through the whole sprint, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to fall apart. And I think yeah. that's one, one of the things people do is they, they, they look at peak velocities and, uh, that can be very deceiving because if you stumble, yep. you're going to create a spike because yep. your, your mass is going to fall faster, but then you've got to catch yourself on the yep. back end so you don't fall. So I think yep. that, that's, I agree with you completely that there has to be this smooth uh, tracking of data. The data has to be a, a general smooth uh, progression or else you're screwed. Or, or else you're screwed and, and you see it anywhere and everywhere in the run. You can see it anywhere. You might have some gunners who can really get out, really low out of the acceleration. And then they go one, two, three steps and the fourth four step, they fall forwards. And by falling forwards, they then have to stick the leg out to catch themselves, have a massive breaking moment and push themselves up. Yeah. Now, yep. for that individual, got, that. yeah, exactly. So that individual, you've got two choices. Some people say he's coming out too low. So make him come out higher. Okay, he comes out a bit higher. It gives himself a bit more air time, a bit more space in front of himself to be able to continuously catch his steps and not over rotate. Now, but if you've got an individual who has naturally got no fear of falling, is a rocket and can shoot himself out of the blocks that low, you might be taking away something by making him come up higher. Now, a strategy right now to teach him smooth transition is to ask him to come out a bit higher so that he makes sense of what it feels like to have an uninterrupted organic transition. He will suddenly feel how easy it is to get into his max velocity and that maintaining that max velocity feels effortless. That's one lesson plan that he has to take on board. But the other lesson plan is to say, well, you've got a gift here. And the problem is that you go one, two, three, and on three, when you should have transitioned a tiny bit, you actually allow yourself to over rotate so now you're having to catch yourself on four. So the second lesson plan is to say, well, how can we catch three? How can we make you not fall over? 
because now you're us- utilizing his true gift to sh- get shot out of a rocket, but you're allowing him to maintain his uh, DRF. You're allowing him to maintain his acceleration. He's not falling over, stumbling. He's not losing his rhythm, and he's being shot out a rocket and then applying the second, the first lesson, which was transitioning and find himself into good upright running. So I, I definitely think that this stumbling over um, and having to catch yourself is a problem. The same problem the other way around though, you find some individuals come out of the blocks, they shoot themselves up, and then after one or two steps, they fall low. Cause, cause like naturally, just subconscious, they know I have no momentum, I need the momentum. So they make themselves fall low again, but then they, they're stuck with the same problem. It's not smooth data anymore. So those are the individuals that maybe, yeah, it's all about horizontal force, horizontal power, bumble for back, um, trunk discipline, so that they can um, continue to have smooth data again. And I think that's one of the problems that you have when people use a still of someone running is whether it's a KPI or, you know, what's wrong with this person or, and they look at the still and it's like, well, how did they get to that point? What happened in the previous three steps that built up to that point that you're showing me this still? What are their feet doing? What are their knees doing? What's going on with their torso? Did they step funny three steps ago? And this is just a counterbalance to straighten up to where their target is. Or even the aftermath, like what came after that? Mm. That, that, that may look great on the side, you know, a perfect split, but you know, I can train anyone to, all right, you're gonna go run a bunch and then hit, hit a perfect split. We're gonna be right in front of the camera, boom. I'm gonna pull that still out and say, here you go. Well, um, it's, in, it's so interesting. It's like, because it's a story. Pictures, it's a story. When I'm taking pictures, and I love taking pictures of track and field, but even with horrible runners, I can find one picture. I'm taking 10 pictures a second. I can find one picture that makes him look like a great runner. And obviously that's the one I publish. But that speaks to your point that you can find one shape that looks really good, but the other nine shapes are bad he's probably not winning the race. And and say, every, a broken clock is, is right twice a day. Is that right? Is that, yep. is that a phrase? Yeah. <laughs> it is in America, at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Jonas, I'm stealing that when the broken clock is right twice in a day. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, or in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Those are, those are two <laughs> really cool phrases that I like. I mean, I, I, I totally agree that it's a story. And when, um you know, we do some consultancies of groups around the world and, um, they they take video and send it to us and the important video for binary is a static camera with marked out areas so we can calibrate the distance on the screen but it's a static camera i i love to see panning camera i, I love to see people going uh, so if we're looking at a flying 10 from 30 to 40 if possible i would ask them to have a static camera for the flying 10 but also to stand at 30 meters and show me how did they get there because that's, you know, you'll see errors, uh, step length asymmetries, um, airtime asymmetry, you'll just see asymmetries and problems that often stem from early acceleration or mid acceleration. They often extend from there. And so you could, you can talk to the cows go home about what you need to change in your upright running and, and this, that and the other, but actually it wasn't the upright running as a problem. It was the beginning. We see the same problem with people who are doing false velocity profiling. You may do a, a, some kind of um, FE profile for an individual and find that the, the that they are very force dominant and, and acceleration dominant, and so we're suggesting that maybe their max velocity is their biggest weakness. And you can go away and chase and hit max velocity, and, and by all means, I'm sure it will help. But if the biggest issue was that during mid acceleration they didn't raise their hips, they stayed on the ground too long, they o- were overstriding and over rotating and that's why they didn't get to a good top speed it doesn't suggest that they've got a problem with top speed it suggests they've got a problem with acceleration and and the philosophy about how to accelerate so there is this thing where whenever we're collecting data from any of our clients we want some of their subjective stuff as well because actually sometimes that subjective eye of watching a, a normal speed video panning or listening to the ground contact times as they change over time is just as valuable as recognizing the, the time in the FB profile of the, of the early acceleration or the max velocity phase.
one of the things, Jones, that I'm fascinated with right now, um, Chris trained uh, a, a guy that was an American football player last summer um, and, and improved him by one mile an hour. Um, he's a running back for the Chicago Bears, and he's just had just an amazing year. He might be the number two running back in all of American football. And, and this guy had a track and field background, but mainly as a thrower, even though because he was a good athlete, he was on his high school four-by-one team. But he told Chris that he had never truly been speed trained in his life. And here he is, a running back in football. And, and I truly believe that guys that have not been speed trained and instead have been repeat speed trained, which isn't really speed training, it's sprint capacity, um, are capable of becoming one mile an hour faster in eight weeks. I agree. It just drives me crazy that there are still professional athletes with million dollar contracts that have not reached their genetic ceiling. Do you see this in rugby? Yeah, I see it everywhere. Um, and it's good. It's good for me and for me and Chris and you because it gives us clients. Right. But um, essentially, um, it's, it's everywhere in the world. Every single place I go, every single place I consult with or do coach education with. It's always the same issue. And it's because um, it's easy to do fitness and it's scary to do speed. This, this is the reality. This is people's reality, is that it's scary to do speed. And sometimes even the SNC coaches and fitness coaches are scared to do it because the head coaches are telling them, do not break my athletes. We, do want, we don't want to do speed testing. They're not giving them enough time and in those situations, I've got to encourage people to manage up and man up at the same time or woman up, because if they're not giving you the time, it's because you haven't justified why you need it. So there are several reasons for why it's happening. But the reality is um, Eddie Jones came into England rugby and said, we need everyone to be faster and we need to do more speed training. Jürgen Klopp went into Liverpool and started to play this really fast game and train really fast. And people went down, people got injured, and the head coaches didn't say, do less. They said, do your job better. If they're breaking down, figure out why they're breaking down. But just because you can't train them to be faster doesn't mean I want slower players. Yeah, you need to find a way. Is it your sports medical? Find a way. Is it your training periodization? Find a way. Is it biomechanics and technical? Find a way. But Let's not make excuses. But that is very rare. That is one out of 10, one out of 12 coaches that you come across. Everyone else is scared and everyone else disempowers their team to develop speed. And you get heavies um, or forwards, big players who are told they cannot run fast. That's not their job. Your job is to accelerate. But if you improve their speed, accelerating is easier. It's just simpler. If you... If you've got heavies who've got great maximum strength but aren't very powerful and reactive, you make them reactive and, and just give them a tiny bit more in their top speed. Guess what? Their power goes through the roof. Their rate of force development goes through the roof. Their motor unit recruitment goes through the roof. Their hamstring recruitment goes through the roof. It becomes a bit more healthy. They're, and you, you quoted something the other day. The game feels easier if you're faster. Um, and so it just comes back to coaching. And so once you're empowered by your head coach, once you're no longer fearful and you're almost encouraged because you're part of the Feed the Cat cults. Yeah, I don't know. When, when, is, when is church for Feed the Cats? Is it Sunday, Saturday? Is it Friday? I don't know how it works for you guys. But three days a week, whatever three days you want. <laughs> you go to church three days a week. So whatever it is, now you're empowered. Now is the scary part. The scary part is now you have to coach. Now you have to see movement. You don't know what to focus on. You have to give cues. You have to give information to the athletes. Um, you have to time and measure. When do I time? Do, I, do you time at the wrong time so you're getting bad scores? Do you time at the right time? Um, there, there now becomes some other areas that are, isn't typically taught on a degree and isn't typically taught in a normal SNC forum. Um, and so, but that, that's why I think you guys are going to be the pioneers, especially in the States, but around the world, because People are coming like, now Now we're ready. We're ready to lose our virginity. Now show us your moves, yeah? 
that, and that's that's the problem is when people are ready, they don't know what to do and they get with the wrong guys, right? And so now we're ready, show us what to do, take us through the process. Um, because the same thing you identify is the same thing we see here. You know, we had we had guys in COVID or during the lockdown um, take our pro programs, go from uh, 8.9 meters per second to nine and a half to 10 to nine, eight to 10, five. Yeah, we've had two premiership defenders so again, positions that aren't notorious for their speed, but premiership football players who have come to us in the mid nines or early nines and left beyond 10 and a half metres per second using binary, but using, also using their own GPS units that they go back to the clubs and show. And, and, people, then, and don't realize, people don't realise how significant that kind of speed game is. It almost turns a guy into a totally different athlete. 100%. 100%. And this one particular defender went and played in a Champions League game against one of the fastest um, the attackers in football at the moment, but definitely in, 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 in European football, and manhandled this guy, completely covered every single run and made him look like he was slow. And that's the difference. That's the difference, is that no matter what, your value as a player in nearly every sport even in bloody EA Sports on the PlayStation, the value of your player is based on speed, right? Every agent I talk to says, if you can make this guy uh, half a meter per second faster, you will increase his value by a million and a half pounds just by maybe being a bit faster. So it's, it's almost counterintuitive. We know running faster doesn't just make you better for your game. Let's say you can't appreciate it in your game because you can never be exposed to those speeds. Guess what? Your speed reserve goes through the roof. Let's say um, it's not just about speed reserve and your ability to repeat sprint, but actually your, the toll it takes on your body reduces. Um, you, there are so many benefits to speed, yet the industry seems to be, it seems to be the last thing people choose to focus on because of this fear factor of essentially losing your virginity. How about the, uh, <laughs> this feeds right into the same thing. How many people say that a guy is fast enough? Yeah, all the time. I, I heard it. All the time. Like yeah, all the time. He's fast enough or he doesn't need to be faster for his job. Yeah. And it's like, come on, man. We know that whatever job you think he's got, if you raise his ceiling, his job is easier. Simple. It's just yeah. excuses. You're always going to just find excuses and, uh, and you'll find people chasing their tail and confabulating and, 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 and the information goes in one ear, goes out in the other. They choose to focus on what they want to focus on. And it comes down to fear and trust. That's what it really comes. Do you trust your ability to make someone faster? Are you fearful of, make, of breaking them? And essentially, how is your job measured? If your head coach comes in and says, if these players aren't faster, you're gone then you will find a way, you'll be, you'll be feeding the lions, yeah, you'll find a way, right? Whereas if a head coach comes in and says, actually, you can't break any players, then you're fearful of doing anything that works. And that's why I come back to Eddie Jones. Eddie is really pure about the fact that to be the best team in the world, um, putting, your play, putting the opposition under pressure with speed is his priority. Speed, 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 and repeat speed, and speed again in the last quarter, in the last third of a game when it really matters. And of course, contextual speed. Can you do your skills? Can you fend, carry a ball whilst staying fast? Okay, by all means, contextual speed. But regardless, all of that is made easier for Eddie to train if they come to him fast. So the build up to the World Cup camp last year, they had 12 weeks maybe to, to get ready for the World Cup. I, I had a lot of the back line with me for three to six weeks and really, it was to deal with the issues they had from the previous season from playing in the Premiership. So I had to sort out ankles and knees and, and kind of get their bodies ready. But the biggest priority is get them moving fast, early, so that when they go to him and they have to condition and they have to do rugby-specific stuff, it is, feels relatively simple for them. If you can get them from 9.5 to 10.5 metres per second and the average game speed is 8, life becomes simple. I think that was one of the reasons why uh, I didn't see the game, but I'm told that England ran by uh, 
New Zealand, the All Blacks in the World Chan in the in the World semifinals, mm. and it and it wasn't even a wasn't even a game. And then you know other things happened in the next game. But I think uh, England just won seven nations, and did the they same did. thing. They did. It was autumn internationals. Uh, the Six Nations is coming up, and um, we don't know if it's actually going to happen. Um, there's some cancelled games, but yeah, by all means, like the. Speed, I think speed, everyone knows in every game and everywhere that speed is important. It's just, um, it's, it's always funny how we find ways to, to focus on other things. Changing subjects a little bit. I'm fascinated with, with little kids and youth uh, athletics. We're living in the, in the States right now in a time when when parents kind of choose a sport for a kid when they're maybe five years old, mm. I mean, they get them signed up for an expensive travel team that they're traveling all over the country before they even, you know, can, can read a book. You mm. know, they are a traveling professional in one sport, trying to get a college scholarship, all this stuff. In the meantime, they're being left horribly uh, in deficits of so many skills that playing multiple sports will do for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I see all the time the ninja training that your own son is going through. Do you want yeah. to talk about the ninja training? Ninja training. So ninja training is really born by him. He was watching some YouTube channel or something. And he said, Daddy, I, I want to do that. And I said, OK, well, it's going to take a lot of practice. The guy did some super flips and jumped off some high building and was basically like parkour. And um, Logan, Logan is, uh, is uh, named after Wolverine. Yeah, Logan from Wolverine. Um, my daughter is Catalea, who is named after an assassin from a, a film called Catalea. And, um, and uh, so they were born ninjas and, and they were born assassins. And um, they just, they're like me, I'm pretty bouncy. Like I'm, I'm, I'm heavy, but I'm, I'm bouncy, I'm elastic. Uh, and my, my wife's very athletic and, and my wife's family are all very athletic and have great hand-eye coordination and do racket sports and golf. My, my mother-in-law still plays golf. So he's surrounded by athletic people and, you know, he's grown up at the track and he sat on Greg Rutherford's lap when he won medals and he's been around sub-10 sprinters and, and um, elite pole vaulters. And he's, he's seen all of that stuff from before he could walk. So he has no limits in his perception of what the human body can do, I, I believe. And, um, so just keeping him active. Uh, people say, you're a great dad. Really, I like to walk the dogs and burn them out. We don't have any pets, but I call them the dogs. Every day, you've got to walk the dogs, sometimes three times a day. If not, they will burn you out. Yeah, so it's who, who's going to win. They're, I don't want them to win. i got to win. So I've got to make them do stuff. We've got a trampoline. We go in the forest. We climb trees. He watches videos, and, and he's taught himself. in During the first month of COVID, he taught himself to do a front flip at the age of five, right? He taught himself to do a cartwheel. My daughter is, was two and a half at the time. She watched him do that. He was at the age of five. She watched him a month later, she could do a cartwheel. So she's improved uh, literally at half his age, how to do, to, they're just learning to do stuff because one, uh, you know, my mum is a scaredy cat, but my mother-in-law is the opposite. And so there's a nice balance between risk and, and I guess monocoddling. So like I push them to try and do anything they want. They're a YouTube generation. They watch Ninja Kids. They watch people parkour videos all the time and gymnastics videos. And he literally watches and goes and copies. And he said, dad, look, this is called a flipping sexy. I've never heard of that before, but apparently it's a, it's a move from Fortnite. You do a flip and then you land on your side in, in like a pose like this. Now, um, one, of the, one of the damnedest things I've ever seen was Logan climbing the door frame. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So even if he doesn't have a tree, he's even climbing he things in the house. Yeah, yeah, he's climbing things in the house and breaking things in the house, and um, and yeah, just trying to keep him moving, just just challenging him all the time to, to try and do something different. He's done gymnastics, he, and you know, we, some of it's we pay for it, and he goes to a class with all the kids, and some of it is just like, okay, let's let's buy a bar. So we've got like a like a like a dipping bar, but that you use for gymnastics in our garage. It's not very big. It's too, it's too small for me to balance on it. But him and my daughter just love it. They're learning to do somersaults in the bar. They're learning to do lots of things. A lot of it's freestyle and free play. Um, and I think as long as they can catch and they can throw, 
and that when they fall down, they're happy to get up and they can roll and they can jump from heights um, and they know how to absorb. You know, what's so good about the Cubans is they start plyometrics very early in life in barefoot. And so like they harden the bones, you tell, you tell the nervous system, it's okay to deal with shock um, and you get the tendons ready. And so I think like more than anything, like going back to your original point of early specialization, more than anything, when I coach, so talking about rugby, Anthony Watson's one of the best fullbacks or wingers in the world, and his brain plasticity is amazing. He, he, he double Achilles surgery, he'll, he'll come back and in the first session, he'll be moving skew if with a few cues, with a few exercises, all of a sudden his movement patterns change. That doesn't happen a lot with a lot of athletes. Often you have to almost give, take away the fear and the threat and take time to get them back to being aggressive in their contacts. Now, I think brain plasticity is, is born of the ability to do different things in different ways. And if you grow up in a multi-sport environment or you're doing one sport, but you're training lots of different ways outside of that sport, when you get older, you get put in a position where you have to, where, where you're able to change, you're able to adapt, you're able to have movement variability. And we all know that movement variability is the underpinning of health and healthy movement patterns. So ninja training is the way forward for everyone, I think. <laughs> I love it. I, I'm, gonna make... throw, I'm gonna throw this question out to both of you. Um, I can't remember who said it. God, I hate to quote Stu McMillan, but it may have been Stu. Um, and, and he said something like, you know, we're in a constant search as, as people that are down this rabbit hole of performance and all that. We're in a constant search for the right things, the new things, the, um, and we're not real sure of truly what works. And mm. anybody that thinks they're sure of it, matter of fact, you were interviewing a big, strong sprinter in your presentation who made the comment, hey, and it worked. And I'm like, bullshit. You know, you don't really know. Yes, mm -hmm. something happened, but you really, you cannot connect the dots and say the stuff that you did created the performance that you, that you had. Mm -hmm. And so, so even though we're uncertain about what truly works, really good coaches are pretty certain about what doesn't work. Think about that for a second. Can, can both of you uh, talk about things that don't work in speed training? It's a bit difficult. A generalization? Yeah, or I don't, I don't think you can. I don't think you can say this doesn't work for everyone. I, don't, I think you can't go to that extreme. And, and no. plus there, there's such a progression that goes through uh, the development of someone that hitting the right exercise at the right time, you're going to have an instant change. Whereas if you're completely off and, you know, you know, for, uh, any kid, you know, a spindly middle school kid and you get them stronger, they're going to run faster, but is that going to work for a 23 year old who's, so I think there's, it, it's, it's such a complex movement. And there's so many things going on that when you hit it right with whatever you've got, you know, it's going to work. And so I think that's why you need as big of a toolbox as possible, because the longer you do this, you start to make some generalizations or, you know, you see things and you know, you know, to use that exercise when you see this happening. Mm. Mm. So now, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree though, that, that, the endurance-based distance coach mentality of coaching track and field um, has hurt the, I mean, I, I would think that uh, running 20 miles a week generally does not work to ever improve speed. Yeah, you know, I mean, are you looking at specific philosophies or you want specific exercises? Either. Oh, I think, yeah, you can either have one or the other. So it's a, it's a fulcrum. So if I do all this endurance work, you know, I'm not going to have any speed, but if I do a lot of speed work, you know, so you want to try and find the balance of what your race is and what your sport is into where it needs to be. But yeah, you can't, 
go out and run 80% and then expect to turn it on and, and run faster. And I think the magic of timing is that we know, you know, once, once I got a free lap, you know, I knew that this wasn't working because I saw all my kids getting slower because yeah. of this, this workout. So I said, well, get rid of, uh, your repeat 200s, you know, and I, and I think it's different for the Altus guys because they have those kids year round and, uh, you know, they aren't the most, uh, they don't push it as hard as we may because we have younger kids, but you know, for what we do and then the limited time that we have with our athletes as high school coaches, Tony is, you know, I, I think I figured out that we, in my track season on a regular year, uh, we have like 24 hard workouts. And that just happens to be perfect for what we do is we can do short and fast and it works great for those 24 workouts. I, I think one of the things I, I like about what you said was because we time, we know. Yeah, and if, if we you have don't data. Time, yeah, if you don't time, you're coaching in the dark. And I think back to me running 10 years of track and field, middle school, high school, and college. And the fact that I was never timed at a max speed ever in practice. No, never. Ever. ever. In any race. Ever. We, matter of fact, we were told not to wear spikes in practice because we would have broken legs, broken shins. <laughs> so, so oh, I'm pretty certain that doesn't work. I think what what's clear to me you know i i was fortunate to have a maybe five or six kids from the age of 15 at 16 coached them for seven or eight years and watched them develop make lots of mistakes with them and other kids but watch four to five of them actually develop from kids to olympians and make enough mistakes and have enough time and opportunity to go back and rectify those mistakes and need to um, and, and train a certain way enough until it became stagnant and have to find a new way in a different way and, and, and lots of different variations of that same theme allowed me to realize most things do work. The difference is how long do they work for? That's right. Most things do work. The difference is do they, they sometimes they only work in isolation or they only work when mixed with other components of training. And when I say most things, I mean most training philosophies. And so when I think to um, my program and what I learned specifically from Dan is, is an eclectic collection of different training sessions, different ways of training, or let's look at multi-events program because my wife has probably been one of the biggest influences on my training. In fact, in the two years building up to my first sub 10 runner, most of the edits in my program came from my wife and her influence on our on our running and what what i definitely see and I, I definitely lost my point there actually um most things work most things don't work in isolation um fine okay an eclectic mix recognizing that actually there's probably four different ways of training people across the week that a, a multi-events program will address they'll definitely address some kind of speed they'll definitely address some kind of repeat speed They'll definitely address in some kind of intensive running and they'll probably have some kind of extensive running in their program. Now, those of those four training sessions, they will never be the same intensity across the year. There'll be some years where th there'll be some phases where extensive running has the bigger priority in that week. And now, it doesn't mean that they're um, running extensively four times a week because they're still finding a way to do these other sessions. It just means that the dose of that is a bit more and there's a rhyming reason to, to all of it. And, and actually the art isn't saying that I'm a speed guy, Charlie Francis, feed the lions, feed the cheetahs guy. Yeah, I'm not, I, it's not saying, oh, I'm a, I'm a mid zone guy. I'm all about Lance Brownman or Clyde Hart, or, or I'm an extensive running guy. I, I, I train my sprinters like 800 meter runners for three quarters of the year and then I sprint. I think all of all of them sometimes can get you lost. I think it's more recognizing, especially when you've got a group of athletes throughout the whole year, is recognizing there's a time and place for any of these to shine a brighter light. But actually, the biggest deal is that all of those four lights are on. And where I've when I've ran into trouble is when for long periods of time I've stayed in one of those philosophies 
and I've let it overpower the others. And where I've had continual progress or be, I've been able to rehab people really quickly is where I've had plan A, Bs and Cs for each of these units. So even if I've got an individual where I don't do any extensive tempo on the track, running, running anything less than 85% for that individual makes them run badly with only bad habits and I'm trying to erase those bad habits, I do that on a bike or I do that with a circuit. I don't, I don't allow them to do anything that's going to erase the good habits, but I still, um, I still obey my philosophy or, or I still want to feed a bit of that energy system for a particular reason, mainly for recovery when it comes to extensive work, intensive work, mainly for rhythm and timing because you're moving slow enough to make sense of the, the shapes, but it's not fast enough to feel uh, like it's going to throw you off. Um, repeat speed mainly so that they can buffer the, the pH of where their real speed takes them to. And then speed work because that's the event. So there, there's a rationale for each of those philosophies. And I think when you get really stuck in one for too long, you can fall into problems. And if yeah, I was going to choose think... one, I'll, I'll, I would be feeding the, the lions and feeding the tigers all day, all day long. Because at I the end of the day, when you've got kids, when you've got people that may not always be with you all the time, when you've got, if, if you only had 15 minutes to teach someone about anything for track and field, what will you teach them? How to hold their postures at 70% or how to deal with their event? Deal with their event, of course. I think that variation is the key. And I think with that variation, you know, there, there's other components that go with that, whether it's, you know, the communication between the athlete and you and why you're doing things. And I think in some of these cases, we get these older athletes where they think they need to be in, the, in some kind of shape. You know, if you fight them on that, you may lose them as a client or they may not believe in what you're doing. Um, so there's got to be this shared journey between you and your athlete. And then once you're at that point, you have to take it down one more level and you have to make their body care about what you're doing. So are you doing the same things over and over again? Or what variations are you adding to what you've done in the past to continue to the path of where you want to go? I think that's one of the keys is, you know, what, what are we going for here and how am I going to make the body care about the drill that we're doing so it actually sticks rather than we're just doing a drill and I don't, I'm not seeing any carryover when I film you again or I'm watching you move. Um, and I think that's really the key is we think, okay, this one drill is going to do this one thing. That gets you to point B, but now how are you going to get to C and D? What are you going to add or what are you going to eliminate? to get to the point where you need to go. And, uh, and I think that's what's interesting about measuring so much is you can see the progression of what's going on with your athlete. And when you don't see a progression, that's a huge red flag that it's time to change. And I think if you're stuck in some periodization program that you've planned out for eight weeks and here's our developing volume, you know, what if you hit week three, are you gonna stay with the next four weeks just because that's what you planned out? Or are you going to take a, a five-day break and start from scratch again and say, all right, we had two bad weeks in a row. How have you been eating? How have you been sleeping? What's going on in your life? All that's good. Well, then it's got to be me. Um, yeah. And, and I, need, uh, I need to shit pan what we did in the past, throw that paper out, and start from scratch all over again. But you uh, see, you need big, big, hairy balls to make that decision. You really do. Because a lot of people would say, hmm, it's your fault, athlete. You're not, you, you give me a report that your sleep's well, that your lifestyle's well. It can't be my program. I, I've written my program and I've copied Charlie Francis. I, I've, I've copied this. I, I've done this. It can't be me. It must be you. It takes big balls to go, do you know what? Let me swallow my pride here. It, it's, it's probably me. And your feedback is really clear and really precise because you know your body more than I do. I've got, the, I've got um, a mega wave. I've got... I've got this system for measuring your recovery. You've got your sleep measured on your watch. You've got all these, these gadgets, but the most important information about how the athlete is uh, recovering and responding is the athlete's feedback. And that you know, feedback uh, might manifest himself in what they say. It might manifest in how their body is responding to training, right? But well, one of my favorite uh, stories that, uh, of Chris Corpus was about 10, 15 years ago, he had a sprinter who was not responding and he literally stopped practicing him mm. and he got faster. Yeah. 
Is that correct, Chris? One day a week. We did three five tens once a week. And he got faster. And he, he was went, not he getting went from faster. 11, he went from 11 flat to a 1051. Wow. wow. And that's the type of courage that I think Jonas is talking about, that with some kids, and I think just listening to both of you talk, I think points out so much that we have to develop a dialogue back and forth. To a lot of our kids, they don't even think about their body. They don't mm -hmm. think about training. They just come and do what they're told. But if you question them, they become, hopefully, to the point where they start to build their own house and take ownership. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I agree completely. Jonas has been great, man. We need to do this again someday. Yeah, yeah. I looked at the clock. It's, I, I, it says 17 minutes. I was like, yeah, just I was, oh, an hour and 17. Oh, okay. <laughs> This is this has gone real fast. So it's really gone really fast. We appreciate and my, my you kids so haven't much. come in here interrupted. So even when this podcast finishes, I'm going to stay in here for another 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to pretend. I'm going to talk to myself. Then no one will know. I think there you go. take take it from two people who are in different stages of life. My kids are in college and high school, and Tony's are out. So appreciate them at this age because when they get older. They have very little use for you other than a $20 bill or a set of car keys. Yeah. And yeah. Just keep walking those dogs. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got to walk the dogs, man. Walk the ninjas. Keep them going. Awesome. I love it. That's a great place to stop. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Happy Thanks, New Year, Jonathan. Jonathan.